Because to kick us off, let's talk about health care. Now, for some of us, the renewals are coming. For some of us, we've just got the renewals. So for some of us, the renewals are coming up very quickly. So I don't want to cause shock and awe, but I want you to take a moment and think about the last time that you had your renewals. If a person sitting next to you and they're collapsing, just catch up. <laughs> how many of you felt like this? Come on, how many felt like this? How many felt like this because you were only in the single digits? <laughs> right? All right, how many of you had negative trend this last year? How many of you got a negative? I only had like a couple of you that actually raised your hand high. A couple of you like tucked away. It's like, shh. I don't want to teach this. How many of you had negative trend for uh, multiple years? Check that out and go get their numbers. Is it possible? It's like the unicorn. It's the mystical, magical unicorn. Is it possible? It is actually possible to have negative trend multiple years. For most of us, it's kind of like this, is it not? We see the email in the inbox and we know what's coming and we don't want to click it open. Or we see the broker making the phone call and we don't want to oh, we don't want we don't want to answer the phone, do we? Any of you feel like this? I know, reach out, let it all out. This is group therapy, right? Get out again, it's okay, it's okay. This is how we tend to manage this. This is how we tend to manage this. And unfortunately, that's how we do this. And we've been doing this for decades. This is how we've been managing healthcare. And unfortunately, that's how it's been. This is the latest and greatest. These are the SHRM numbers from February about the average cost. For some of you, it may be higher. Some of you, it may be lower. It depends on what we're offering our employees. Depends on who we have employed, does it not? Depends on what our risk factor is. Depends on what's been going on with our claims. I know that uh, well, it's been four years ago when I was VP of HR down in California, our family plan was over $30,000 a year. I don't know if some of you are in that same boat. We were giving away the farm, and that was four years ago. That's incredible. Is that sustainable? That's not sustainable. I gotta tell you, I mean, 20 years ago, it was over 20 years ago, when I was uh, just kind of starting things out, you know, was, uh, I've been doing HR for a bit, and we're opening the renewals, I'm thinking, this can't be sustainable. And here we are over 20 years later, and guess what I'm saying? It's still not sustainable, because how are we managing this? How are we managing it? The same way we've been managing it for at least the last few decades. Same thing. But guess what? If we keep doing what we've been doing, what? Gotta keep getting what we've been getting. Same old process, same old problems. And if you think about this, and we still we talk about health care reform, how many times have we seriously been talking about health care reform? At least three times over the last 20 years, have we not? We're going to have health care reform. And it goes through the same cycles and the same chatter and the same talk, does it not? It's the same stuff, different day. Same stuff, different day. And here we go again. Here we go again. We're waiting for somebody to fix this, and it's not. Here's the trend over the last 30 years. Does that look like it's getting fixed? <laughs> this is our average uh, national health care expenditure, but guess what? I don't know about you, but that doesn't look like it's working. It doesn't. How do we do this? How do we do this? Here's what I figured out. Health care reform is local. Health care reform is up to us as individuals. It can work, we can do this, but it's not going to happen by anybody else. The solutions are not going to come from anybody else but you, and it's up to us to figure this thing out. And so you're coming to this session saying, well, what do you have to, to offer to me? Well, you know what? i got to tell you, all of us are asking the same question, but here we are on the third day of the, of the conference. This class is you know, more or less halfway full, but that's okay because most people want, don't want to take the long walk. But we're all still suffering it because we've all been attending this same session for the last 20 years looking for solutions. Either we're not listening to the same old stuff, or we're not willing to take the long walk because we're not willing to take the different approaches. It's one of the two. Sorry. So who am I anyway? Right? So anyway, just a quick intro because who's this guy? I don't know. Anyway, I'm Wade. I work for a company called Blackstaff. And besides, you know, the, 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 the name doesn't, we're not a staffing company. I work for Wagstaff. It's not a staff, nor are we a dog walking company. 
<laughs> but we're based out of Spokane, Washington. We're a manufacturing company. We manufacture aluminum casting equipment. So we're based out of Spokane, Washington, but we also have a location in Kentucky and some operations that are out of Russia, Dubai, and China. Uh, but uh, we, have, uh, we have productions and we manufacture these goods for companies that are in about 75 different, different countries. And so we are a smaller company. We have uh, under 1,000 employees. And for some of you, you may say, well, that's a small company. Or some of you may say, well, that's a good mid-sized company. But here's the deal. The solutions that I'm talking about are all scalable. They're all scalable. It really is. And so when we talk about these things, this is why it's right for us, is because I can go and I can implement some things, and if it works, great. And if it doesn't, I can stop and I can pivot, and we can do, change some things up pretty quick. And so the things I'm talking about here today are things that I've done in the last three years. I've been with this company for about three and a half years, and so the things I'm talking about, everything except for one thing I'm going to talk about, we are doing. And that one thing I'm not going to do, but I'm going to throw it into the mix because it's a hot topic or a topic that you've heard about. I'm not going to talk about it much. Yeah, but I will get to that. Uh, but uh, it, it's, everything else that we're doing in here is stuff that I'm doing. And that's what it's going to take is a full frontal assault to make these things work. I don't have a huge staff. I don't have a single person who's dedicated to all of this stuff. We're doing health care in addition to all of our other duties as a sign, if you will. So this is something that we do in addition to everything else that we do. So keep that in mind. I don't have a full-time benefits person. I really don't. We have a really small staff. So this is what we're doing. But all we did is we asked this question, what if? The other challenge that we have with this is we're coming into this and we have a challenge in front of us. When I got you there three years ago, here's what they were facing. And again, this is, as you're saying, well, that's all the numbers you got. That's, that's, that's nothing. Again, this is all scalable. Before I got there, in the previous four years, they had doubled their spend on health care. Does that sound familiar? In four years, they doubled their spend. So I do what you ought to do if you haven't done it yet. I projected out and said, if all things being equal, all things being equal, what would the spend be over the next 10 years? Have you done that? If you've done it, did you vomit? <laughs> uh-huh. You're gonna. You're gonna. Because those numbers don't lie. Those are based on real numbers. All things being equal, that's what it is. Because I guarantee you that our revenue doesn't change that much but our spend will. So you ask this question, what if? What if we could do that? So naive as to think that we can actually, you know, change the curve downward, but what if we can bend the curve? Well, here's what's happened, and here's where the punchline is. Over the last three years since we've been there, we actually did bend the curve down. We've bent the curve, and uh, today, you know, today we've saved millions. We've saved millions of bucks. On this tiny little plan that we've got, that's a few million bucks. Yeah, we've saved millions of bucks. Save millions of bucks. How many? I'm at 2.2 million of my reserve so far. We started at zero. And that's in two years' time. On this tiny little spend of about six million bucks a year. It's all scalable. And it's all doable with a handful of employees. Let's figure out how. So my goal today is not to tell you that this is the secret recipe because all of you have some different situations. All of you have different employees and different, you know, different bosses. You have different plans, you have different whatever, and you're going to tell me, Dude, that's not going to work for me. That's fine. That's fine. My goal is to have you come up with some different scenarios, some different ideas. Because if you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to keep getting what you've been getting. And so come up with some new ideas, some new thoughts, some new patterns, and that's what my goal is today. But let's get started. My intention is to maybe shift you into a new mindset. Come up with some new ways of thinking, some new ways of doing things so you can get some new results. That's what my goal is today. <laughs> So here's the cycle, and this is the vicious cycle that we get into. Let's say that your plan year starts in January, January 1. If this is where your plan year starts, we usually have open enrollment, you know, roughly in here, right, a few weeks beforehand. Sound familiar? And so what happens? Well, it's about in here that we start making those plan design changes, and that's uh, because why? Because we got the renewal back here, right? So what's most people's strategy? Well, just before the renewals, we start here. <laughs> to whichever deity you pray, understand that hope is not a strategy. Not a good one. Well, they say we're in HR. We live by this. But sometimes we live by hope. Uh, but, but it's not an effective one. But understand that if we wait until the renewals to figure stuff out, we only have one strategy, and that is mitigation. 
That's the only strategy we have because we can't change the past. As my broker loves to say, the claims are the claims. Have you heard that before? <laughs> the claims are the claims, right? I know. Watch me negotiate. <laughs> right? And that's that, that's what I have left is, is I, can, I can mitigate. But really, that's the only solution that I have is mitigation. And so we really have two, two options. Do I carve out the benefits or do I pass the costs on to the employees? Does that sound That's our strategy, that's mitigation. <coughs> that is not a long-term solution. And let's be honest, the employees are exhausted. The employees are tired of that. They're waiting for open enrollment only to find out how bad it's gonna be. That's what open enrollment is for them. <coughs> we need to start sooner. Through this cycle, our cycle has to start after open enrollment is done to say, what are we gonna do to start making this happen for next year? What are we going to do to start affecting this? Because what's the number one driver of cost? Claims. Claims are the number one driver of cost. If we want to shift the cost down, we have to affect claims. That means we have to make the claims go down. What does that mean? Healthy people don't get sick. Healthy people don't go to the doctor, which means that if we want the claims to go down, the cost to go down, we have to get our people to be healthy. And that's where the shift comes in. We have to have them be better consumers of healthcare. We have to get them healthy, and that's where the behavior shifts. No, this is not just another wellness conversation, although wellness is at the heart of this, and we'll get into that. But there are other things to make them smart, other things to make them smart. But this is why this has to start here at the <coughs> year in advance conversation, and that's where we're going. Okay, now at this point, most people are asking me, so how do you do this? Give me a laundry list. Give me the list of how to give me the same results as you've got, Wade. Had somebody that asked my broker, tell me, oh great broker, how can I get the same results as Wade did? Go talk to Wade. I, he spends a half a day with me. And he sees what I've done, and I'm telling him, look, you've got to get educated. You have to take a multi-year approach. You have to do this. There's gonna be a lot of work on your, on your, on your part. And he gets done with the day. I said, you understand, yes I do. The next day he calls up his broker and he says, you know what, here's the deal. I've been a client of yours, just like Wade's been a client of yours. I don't have the same results, you're fine. What? You didn't get a thing that I said. That's the broker's not gonna give you these solutions. Nobody's gonna hand you these solutions. This is up to us as the employer to do, so keep that in mind. The how is the last question to ask. We have to start with two other questions, and that is, what do you want? What do you want out of this process? That's the big question. Number two is, why do you want it? Because if you don't understand what do you want and why do you want it, then the how isn't gonna, gonna matter because the how's just gonna be another laundry list. You gotta take this back, talk to your boss, say, hey, this is what I gotta do, why? Because I went to Sherman, they told me to. <laughs> That's great. That's great. The CFO's gonna talk you out of it, not fund it. Let's talk about this. What do you want? You see, nothing is dynamic unless it's specific. That's what dad told me. If you want dynamic results out of this program, out of your costs and your, your outcomes, you gotta be specific about what you want. And that's what we're talking about. What exactly do you want? We're going to clarify this here in a bit. The why is significant. Why do you want what you want? If money is the only driver behind this whole program, it will never work. Keep that in mind. As you have the conversation with your executives and your CFO, if money is the only reason why you do any of this, it will never work. And this is why. Because as soon as you go out and start talking to the number one person who you have to convince to change behavior, which is your employee, and then their spouse, and their dependents. If they find out that the only reason you want to do this is to save a buck, you're dead. That is not a compelling enough reason for them to change their behavior. Even if you tell them that the number one reason that you want them to change is to save them a buck, that is not enough of a reason for them to change their behavior. It's not compelling. It's not compelling. They'll say that's nice. Next topic. Stop. That's it. You see, when we started this program, that wag step, and again, this is not unlike the other program that we started before this. I'll talk a little bit about that later. This is round two of what we've done, of what I've done with this. This is our number one goal. It's to improve and maintain the health and well-being of our employees and their families. That's our number one goal. And why is that? Because I know that healthy employees are happy employees. Happy employees are productive employees. Productive employees come to work. Productive employees perform. Productive employees don't get sick. They don't complain. They are happy. They stay. 
do they not? They don't incur workers' comp as much. They don't incur all these other problems as much. They're good employees. But what happens then is if they're healthy, they're gonna save some money to themselves. They're not gonna incur as much, as much cost. They're gonna save money themselves. That's more money in their pockets. But here's the deal. If I solve goal number one and goal number two, then I'm gonna make money for me as the company. Rank order. These are rank orders. And you know what? Even today, these are my goals. These are my goals. Health and well-being of the employee and their families so that they understand we're working for you and your family. That's commitment. That's commitment. Then number two, I'm going to save you guys money. Then number three, we the company to save money. And why is that important? Because we have a very aggressive profit sharing program and a very aggressive bonus program. That's all tight profits. And they know that. They know that. All right, number three. Now, how do you get there? You gotta, that depends on who's working for you. Because if you're the only person who is tied to this and doing this yourself, it's never gonna work because there's a lot of work in here and we've gotta get into that. So let's get started on this because now you're gonna start to work me over with some excuses. Well, we're fully insured, so no, this is gonna work. Nice. My very first round of this was with a fully insured program in the public sector. And you know what? We implemented at least half of these programs and you know what? We saved a million bucks the very first year off of our premiums because of behavior changes. We implemented, maybe not with an HSA, because we didn't go self-funded, but we did it with health reimbursement accounts, HRAs. And we did a lot of these same things. And we saved a million bucks in the first year, and we continued to save millions after that. So, fully insured, it'll still work. Well, we're too small. There's no such thing as too small. This is scalable. Well, you're too small, we're too big. It's all scalable. Let's keep going. The key here is that your expenses in healthcare, health insurance, are typically the number two expenditure on your books, second only to payroll. Right? Yes. It's time to start acting like it. This is your number two expenditure on your books. We manage payroll every what? Every week? Every two weeks? And that is top of mind because that's worth millions. This is your second most expensive single line expenditure on your books. It's time to start managing that that way. Your CFO and your CEO should know it and be aware of it. They should be managing it that way. So knowing that this is your number two most expensive cost on your company's books, not just HR, but your company's books, it's time for you to become a fund manager. This thing is probably costing you more than your 401ks and everything else that they are managing on a daily basis. Time for us to start managing that way. That way. So here's what it's gonna take. This is where we get into the business, and this is where we're gonna to start to shift. So warm up, because it's gonna to start to get a little quick here, okay? So we've got three groups that we're gonna talk about, or three areas that we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about partnerships, best practices, and new mindsets. Now, so for those of you who say, nah, thanks, Wade, as we get into these things like, been there, done that, this is old school. You're about 20 years too late on this. I already know this stuff, I'm already doing that stuff. That's great, fantastic. I did say the best for last. Maybe you'll stick around, maybe not. The new mindsets are where some of the new innovative pieces are. We'll talk about me running people over the border for some goods and services. Stay with me, it's legal. All right, uh, we're gonna talk about partnerships and what it takes to, to reinvent your partnerships and strategies there. We're gonna talk about best practices and maybe you're doing it this way and maybe you're not. And if you are fantastic, that's great. Don't worry, I'm not gonna spend too much time on any single topic. And then we're going to talk about new mindsets and some new ways to do some things. And again, if you're already doing some of these things, fantastic. Again, my goal is for you to come up with an idea or two that you can take back and start to save money right away. That's my intent. Okay, ready to get started? All right, let's talk about your partnerships. Partnership number one is your employees. You have to get the employees on board, and this is the single most important relationship out of this entire game if it's going to work. Your employees have to get on board immediately. Now, here's the one way to do it and that is to help them understand how insurance works. They need to understand that insurance is insurance. It doesn't matter what kind. Why do we not speed in the car? We might get a ticket. And if we get a ticket, what happens? The insurance goes up. Why? Because we demonstrate that we have higher risk. <laughs> Guess what? It, why don't we get car accidents? Because we get the car accident, we go and we get the car fixed. When we get the car fixed, what happens to the insurance rates? It goes up. When we wreck our body and we take it in to get fixed, guess what happens to the insurance rates? It goes up. 
employees don't understand that. They don't. If you can make this connection and then help them understand that when the claims don't go up, neither do their costs, you will start to see the magic happen. This is the very first principle I will teach when I get to any organization. And you think that this is a basic concept? Nobody understands this. Employees do not understand this fundamental concept. But if they're tired of being weighed down with the cost sharing, start to teach this principle immediately. Teach this principle immediately. When they understand that when the company saves money, they save money, this is where the magic will start to happen. People will come to you and they share with you what their genius idea was to save money. And they will do it. This is the number one way to get them on board with you immediately. They need to start working for you. And this is the way to do it. Teach them that insurance is insurance. Number two is brokers. Brokers. If you only see your brokers once a year because it's renewal time, it's time to find a new broker. <laughs> Period. End of story. My broker works for me all day, every day, all year round. When they see my number, they probably say, you pick up the phone. No, you pick up the phone. I talked to the last time. <laughs> but uh, here's the deal. I mean, yes, they're taking care of our insurance plan, but they also need to be my partner with the wellness and the engagement process. They also need to help me out with data analytics, and we'll talk about data in a bit but they need to help me out to know what I need to know. They need to help me understand my population and what's going on because I can't fix what I don't know, but I also can't be the expert of everything. They have teams of people who are experts and they need to help me out with the data and help me extrapolate that. They need to come to me with cost containment ideas. They need to be on my team because how much are you paying them? Tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. For what? For what? Make them earn their money. Make them earn their money. They're not just there to negotiate with the carriers or to herd cats. Make them earn their money because they need to be bringing in new strategies. <coughs> Make them bring in new strategies. Now, I am not afraid to name drop my folks at Mercer because they're phenomenal. You may love your brokers. But I gotta tell you, I also have two brokers. I do, I do, and it drives them all nuts. It's fantastic, it's like being married. I have my, my wife and I have my mistress, it's great. <laughs> and they both hate it because each one wants me to commit. It's great, but it creates this yin and yang tension. It's fabulous, and why do I have two? Now Mercer's my ghost, I'm married to Mercer, I am. I have this little mistress off to the side because they're a little bit innovative. They're on the edge. You know, if I went with that mistress, that'd be living on the edge a little bit too much, right? But they have these edgy little things saying, hey, have you third heard about this? Hmm, that sounds interesting. Come to the dark side completely. Not gonna go there, guys. Not divorcing. Not divorcing. I just keep right there. But I have this, this tension because they both actually keep each other in check. Oh, they both hate it. They really do. And it's not that I don't trust either one, but I actually have two brokers. Interesting. It's interesting. Now, I don't pay the second broker the same as I pay the primary broker, but I do keep them there for a secondary option. How about your carriers? Do your carriers know who they're working for? Do they know that you're paying the bill? Or are you held hostage by your carriers? What do I mean? You know, sometimes they forget who's paying the bill. I just divorced my carrier after decades of a relationship because they forgot who was paying the bill. They did. I'm, tell, I'm telling them what I need as my group is adjusting, as my group is changing, and they wouldn't adapt. Nope, sorry, you can't do it. Here are the rules, here are the guidelines, not going to do it. I need greater flexibility, can't do it. I need to carve this out, can't do it. Goodbye. What do you mean goodbye? We've had you for decades. Goodbye. Right? Do you really have the best deal? Oh, nobody beats our deal. Oh, yeah. Nobody beats our discounts. Oh, yeah. I just carved out my, my RX, saved me $250,000 to get the same network, different contract, same drugs. $250,000 just by making a switch over. Boom. Yeah, that sounds like I got the best deal with that, didn't it? Right? But when was the last time that you really evaluated? I'm not talking about just the surface level scan that you get at the time of renewals. I'm talking about a deep dive. 
looking into your discounts, looking into your rebates, looking into all the games that are played. When's the last time that you took a deep dive and asked the question, am I getting the best deal? Now you do have to take some things into account like disruption with your members. You have to take that into account and, and total value. You have to take those things into consideration. But when was last time, right? Service and relationships are important, but you also have to take into account total value. Next is your providers. Yeah, the doctors, the physicians, the hospitals. Are you getting the best deal from them? How many times do you hear employees saying, well, I went back for the fifth time to my doctor? You can know, you have access to data, in many cases, of who the best providers are. What you're finding is that as managed care becomes more and more managed, because they're making less and less at the point of service, some of these physicians are having the employees come back five, six times to make up on volume what they missed out because they're making less and less from the carriers. They can't go golfing as many times from the doctor's visits, right, because of the discounts that they're getting from the negotiations. And so instead of coming back only once and fixing the problem the first time, they're gonna have them come back four times to make up the same amount of money that they used to be able to make off the first time. And so the employees are having to go back three, four, five times in order for the doctor to make the same amount so he can go get his golf game. You can pay attention to that and find out where that information is. All right, so those are some partnerships to be aware of. Those are some partnerships. Again, any of these topics we can take online, but we're gonna keep this thing moving, okay? All right, let's get into some best practices. Some best practices. I'm laying the foundation again, the first half, laying the foundations, let's talk about some best practices. And again, if you're doing some of these things, fantastic, we'll get to the new stuff here in a bit. All right, number one, you've gotta have a strategy. If you don't have a strategy, you're gonna just be herding cats and juggling balls and that's fine. But understand this, if you're new to this or if you're just kind of entering into this, this has to be a multi-year process. You can't fix this thing in a year. It doesn't happen. You took several years to get to this point, you can't fix this in 12 months. It, but it doesn't have to take a long time, but it, you have to take a multi-year approach. Because when you go to your executives and pitch this, if you tell them that I can fix this in, in the next eight months before the next renewal comes around, they're gonna know that you're full of it. So understand it's gonna take a multi-year approach. But that also means you're gonna to have to have a multi-dimensional approach that you're gonna to have to take several of these strategies into, into account as you're building your pro in your process. But it also has to be participative, meaning that you're going to have to take all of your employees and put them into the mix as part of this. But the interesting thing is this, is that if you start treating your employees like partners, they start to act like partners. Now here's the deal about partnership. We don't have a problem when times are tough to share and make them partners in the loss, do we? costs go up, what do we do? We share the cost with the employees. But when we save money, do we give the same amount of money back to the employees? Heck no. Heck no. We take the money and run. Maybe we'll give them a pass on the cost increase for the year. And that's our way to be a partner. If we're going to be a true partner, we need to talk about giving the money back. Now maybe we can do it in some creative ways to drive behavior. So for example, over the last three years, we gave the money back, but we gave it back into the program that we want the participation in. So maybe we gave a flat rate on the PPO, but we drove the cost down on the HSA program. In fact, we drove it down over the last three years to the point where the HSA program and enrollment is half the cost of the PPO program. This year alone, I just dropped the rates another $100 a month for the family rates. My employees are now at under $300 a month for family rates. It was over $600 a month three years ago. <coughs> That's what we did. Why? Because we made them partners. And so every year when I come back and say, because of your behavior, we're able to chunk this down. So not only are we adding more to the kitty on what we're giving them on the HSA uh, goodies that I'm gonna share in a bit, but we're also chunking down your rates all of a sudden they feel like partners. They can see what the impact is every single day and that's putting more money in their actual pockets, not just funny money. When they start feeling like partners, they act like partners and that's where the genius comes in. So then comes the wellness component and again, this isn't a wellness piece so I'm gonna fly through some of these pieces pretty quick. So understand if you want more on this, that's later but I can spend the whole day on just wellness alone because of its impact. Wellness is the activity arm of this whole deal. We're changing behavior, and if you try to make these cost shifts happen without wellness, you're silly, because it's not gonna happen. 
And I'm not just talking about giving out trinkets and trash. Yes, trinkets and trash are an important part because people like the tangibles, but I'm talking about real behavior change. This means you do have to have rewards and incentives. You do have to have the HSA connection. You have to have this HSA or an HRA if you're fully funded or you have a PPO. You can build in a health reimbursement account. That's an alternative that can work. We'll talk about that later if you want. And uh, you also have to build in some penalties for non-participation. You can hide those as not necessarily penalties, but rewarding good behavior, just not rewarding bad behavior. Let's talk about this. Because Grandpa always told me that you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make a drink, right? But you can always throw salt in the oats. <laughs> you can make that horse thirsty. My job is to throw an incredible amount of salt in the oats. And that's what we do every single year. I can't force you to choose good choices, but here's the thing about programs and choice. Everybody wants a choice. You have to build choice into the program. Even if the second choice is a bad choice, they have to have a choice. I'm just year after year, I make this PPO option such a terrible, unholy choice. It's still a choice. And you know what? I still have 40% of my people that make that choice. Hey, it's an awful choice. It is a god awful choice. But you know what they're doing? They're throwing more money in there to fund all the other incentives for the people that make the right choice. And that's okay. And that's okay. They have a choice. So let me tell you some of the things, right? So we kick it off. Tobacco, the number one, n number one thing that we can tackle right away. And wellness, how can I promote that? Why wellness? Because I know that the number one thing that we can do is keep the healthy people healthy. Bang for the buck, keep the healthy people healthy. Next bang for the buck, those people that are kind of healthy, getting them healthy. Next bang for the buck, those who have one or more conditions, helping them step back into the healthy zone. Those people that are catastrophic, mitigate them, right? Because there's not, there's not a lot we can do there. So we ask the question on tobacco, do I penalize the users or do I reward the non-users? If I go out with a penalty, that's gonna create a bad taste in people's mouths. But if I reward the non-users, that's awesome. That's awesome. Wellness, do I penalize those who are not well? Or do I reward the people who are participating? That's good, that's golden. So let me tell you what we did, right? We have to follow some guidelines here. Guideline number one when it comes to wellness rewards. You can't get million dollar rewards off of five dollar gift cards. Bottom line, you can't. You can't get million dollar rewards off by using five dollar gift cards. It's nice, it's great. Hey, here's a t-shirt, go help us save a million bucks. It doesn't work that way. You can't save money in a piggy bank and expect your 401k to fund you in retirement. It doesn't work that way. Neither does it here in your wellness program or in your in your healthcare program. Number two, the secret to this entire program is you have to give the money back, and this is the genius. As we give the money back to the employees, they get stingy, and as they get stingy, they find some new ways to hold on to that money to be better consumers of healthcare. You want them to drive the claims down? They get smarter on how to stay healthy. They get smarter on how to spend their money better. You want to save money? You give the money back. And we talk about doing it in large volumes. Large volumes. So this whole, hey, I'm gonna fund your HSA with 500 bucks, that's cute. If the, if the deductible is 5,000 bucks, right? We're gonna make the family deductible 10,000 bucks, well, we're gonna fund you $2,500 in your HSA. That's cute. Why? Because, well, we're being generous. You're being generous, they're gonna have to pay the family deductible of another 7,500 bucks out of their pocket before their health insurance even becomes insurance, right? It's not insurance, they're not getting the care that they need. You want this thing to matter? Let's talk about how it becomes meaningful, right? Tobacco incentive, we give them 600 bucks off of their premiums a year. That's gonna drive incentive, right? It's gonna drive incentive. Do I take their word for it that they're not using tobacco? Oh, heck no. We're using tech, no, we're using coding screen. And if their spouse is on the plan, they gotta do it too. Little lollipops, you betcha. We're 600 bucks, I don't wanna take the lollipop, that's fine, you're gonna pay 600 bucks more a year on premiums. Is that meaningful enough to change behavior, 600 bucks a year on premiums? We think so. Make them big enough to change behavior, to get their attention and change behavior. Uh, okay. Yeah? For the tobacco is the do you have to give them the $600 if you provide them with cessation opportunities? We do, we, we do provide cessation opportunities. They have reasonable alternatives. Okay. We're HIPAA compliant. Darn straight. Yep, no, we're HIPAA compliant. Absolutely. 
Uh, beyond the PPOs, they're not ready for it, so uh, and for all the other goodies. So we do offer $300 off of their premiums if all they do is go get the biometrics. We have on-site biometric screens. We do. We do that. But you know what? We also not only chop the rates in half and give them half off of their premiums, but we make the deductible as low as possible, $1,350. And you know what? We let them earn the whole thing back through wellness incentives. Not only that, but we only have two times, right? We have our family deductible of being only two. We let the spouse earn the deductible back too. They can earn 2,700 bucks, the entire deductible back. We give it away. Why do we give it away? Because that's how Weightonomics works. We have found that the genius behind this thing is that if we give the money back, they spend it. They spend it closely, they spend it smartly, and this is how the genius works. You want to save money, you give the money away. And that's how this thing's working. All right, from here again, I'm going to speed this thing up so we can get to the good stuff. But uh, then, you know, the motivation and uh, encouragement, all that comes to participation. And this is, again, in the slides, download the slides. But we are, our year is chock full of activity. And again, this is stuff that we're doing on the side. I've got an active wellness committee that takes care of this stuff. Yeehaw. But then I got pharmacy, and again, just I'm slipping through these next slides so I can get to the good stuff. But pharmacy, you've got to be smart about your pharmacy. And I'm going to talk about a couple of pharmacy options, but you've got to ask better questions. Value design, just the off-the-shelf stuff isn't good enough. Creating a plan design that works for your people because you have a different mix of folks, making sure they can get the care that they need is what's critical. Educating is essential. It's not just enough to slip out the link and say, follow this so that you have the same plan as last year, it's not enough. If you want partners, they have to understand how it works. That doesn't mean just sending out the email and say you're on your own. What we understand in manufacturing, being highly male-oriented, because guys are guys, if we want this stuff to get out there, we need to get this material out to the spouses. And so you know what, we do go old school. We put the mailers in the mail and we get it out to the spouses and we send it home. Because if we pass this out at work, it would never make it to the spouses who are probably the ones who are managing the healthcare. We make the booklets ourselves, we don't have a big marketing department, so we build it in publisher, we print them off old school, we slip them in the mail and we get them home. How do we communicate it out? We invite the spouses in for the sessions, a hand, just a handful of sessions, I record the sessions, put it on YouTube, stick the link on the mailers, get it in the mail so we can educate not just the employees but the spouses and we get it out. That's it. Yes, we have an LMS. Yes, we have an internal learning management system, but the spouses can't access that. So I stick it on YouTube. There's nothing proprietary about this. Let's just get it out. And you know, if somebody goes out and watches my videos and see what, sees what we have, you know what, that's a marketing piece. So there we go. I also mine data. I use third party because the, the stuff the carrier gives me is typically junk. Right? They're telling me what a great job that they do. But if that's all that you have, then, then use that. Get the information from your brokers, but I use a third party to also mine the data. The data about what your employee's conditions are. And the reason for that is I can't fix what I don't know, so that's where I'm going. All right, I smoked through that because again, more than I can see, than I can give in an hour, but let's get to the good stuff. You with me? Yep. Yeah. All right, so we're in our final, we're in a, it's a hockey game, so we're in our last quarter, right? Our last quarter, why do they call them quarter? Period. period, all right, period, thank you. I'm a football guy, I'm not a hockey guy. All right, so we're in our last period. Okay, this is the best period ever. All right, you ready for the newer stuff? Wait, speed back, it took me long enough. I know, here we go. All right, again, some of these things you may be doing, maybe not, but let's get to it. Here we go, final, final period. All right, first one, medical tourism. Not a new concept, but if you're not doing it, I recommend that you look into it. I recommend you look into it. Why? Because it is so unholy expensive to do anything in the United States. But for us to think that the only place that you can actually have medical procedures done is in the U.S. and it be okay is ridiculous. It really is. How did I learn this lesson? I met these fine folks from SEMA Hospital. SEMA Hospital is located in, uh, in, in, in uh, Costa Rica. Maybe you met some folks uh, from them here at the, here at the expo. Like, I'm not endorsed, this is just what I do, right? This is just what I do. And so I uh, met these guys a couple of years ago, went down and said, hey, what do you guys do, what's up? And I've met, I've, I've visited other hospitals in other countries, including Costa Rica, and not all hospitals are the same, so you have to check them all out. But here's where the difference lies. This JCI accreditation is an international accreditation that says they're legit. And that's what's important is, is that quality standard. Am I getting the same quality of care there as I am here? 
So these net promoter scores, if you're familiar with quality standards, you know, that's the that's the, the patient satisfaction. It's in the 90s percentile, right? That says the, the, the individuals receiving care are having a good time and, and enjoy the service. And it was ridiculous. You don't get that here in the States. You really don't. Most infection rates, you can have add-on insurance. Well, what happens if something goes wrong? You can have add-on insurance. All these things happen. The next door recovery, so what happens when they leave the hospital? Where do they recover? They have a concierge service that goes that goes with them with medical travel option that connects with them that uh, that, that allows them to, to set you up in a hotel or in a, in, in a you know, Airbnb or something like that to recover. They're on site to go back and forth to the to, to the doctors. And so with the total package included, I mean, we have the potential to save you know, as much as what, 60% after all costs in. So I can send them, their spouse, they want to go vacation before the procedure on I mean, knees backs that kind of stuff it's crazy and so on the one hand it's nice for me to go down and say well that's nice and i went down i took a tour it's like well this is crazy this is excellent all right so that's the picture of the person you thought you were coming to see today i tried before i bought yeah i did in december in december of this last year yeah, yeah. So I went ahead. Went, I went ahead and done for the surgery. I did my own little weight loss thing, you know, last year uh, with weight down. But my family's prone to it. But my uh, my siblings had some success with weight loss surgery uh, in years past. I'm like, let's give it a shot. <laughs> phenomenal. It's phenomenal. So I get like, I don't get anything for it. I don't play for it. But uh, that's just saying, you know, if I'm gonna send my employees down, I'm gonna go check this thing out. And uh, uh, worked all right for me. But uh, that's just what. But that's just one of those things where uh, out of country medical care is is uh, is pretty good. It's, it's really good, phenomenal experience. All right, let's talk about direct bill, direct billing. This is a trend where again, this is an opportunity for you to save a ton of cash, ton of cash. Now you may have a big network of hospitals, doctors, facilities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, they may own your local market. They might. If you're a large enough employer, you may have enough clout with one of those large networks to go negotiate with them directly for rates. Chances are good, even if you're a smaller employer, or even if you're in a larger city or area and you're not that big of an employer, there's going to be an independent network somewhere with whom you can directly negotiate rates. We found ours in little old Spokane, Washington, who's just across the border in North Idaho, an independent hospital. And we said, hey, what's up? They said, what's up? Let's negotiate rates. And we negotiated rates that are ridiculous for the day-to-day -day things, things like procedures and surgeries and MRIs. Yeah, I'm talking about MRIs especially. These are ones where, again, the local, the local network, I, I had a couple of guys pop in, they're like, you know, I have this complex so, uh, shoulder surgery. The local place where everybody goes to, it's going to be $2,700 for this complex MRI. It goes over here, we say, how much is it going to be? 1100 bucks. That's cash. That's cash. What does it take? Let's sign up. Let's get this thing going. That's my cash rate. And why would they do that? Right? Other MRIs are that same kind of discount. Other procedures, and again, now I have the opportunity. I can say, do you want to go to Costa Rica? you want to go 20 miles over? You know, some things work for us to go Costa Rica. Some things work for us to go 20 miles over the border to Idaho, whatever. I have options. But because I have this direct billing scenario set up, why would they do that? Why would they do that? Number one, they can because they're not part of this big conglomerated network. They have lower overhead. And because it's a private hospital, they don't have an ER to have all those big overhead costs. And so they have a lower overhead. Number two, they're going to direct bill me because they're going to get my payment in 14 days, not 14 months. Right? They don't have to deal with the admin costs and everything else. What they can also do is negotiate with the, or they, or they can manage the deductible. So those who are on the HSA plan, right, because I can't waive, I can't waive the deductibles. But they can work with my employees who are on the HSA plan so that they haven't met deductibles yet, they can run the portion through the deductibles and bill the insurance at my negotiated rate. What's in it for my employees to go here? I get to waive all the co-pays and all the out of pocket costs. So my incentive to go here, my incentive to take them to Costa Rica or anywhere else is free health care. That's my incentive to drive my employees to Costa Rica or to here in this case. I can waive all their deductible, or not their deductible, I can't waive that. I can waive their co-pays and I can waive their co-insurance so it becomes free health care to the employees. That's what's in it to the employees. Cool. Very cool. I save thousands, they save hundreds. Let's keep going. This is 
the next big one. It's pharma tourism. Yeehaw! This one is awesome. Hold on tight. Yes, it's legal. All right, so with medical travel option, they introduced me, in this case, to provide Rx. This is working with the specialty drugs. Anyone getting killed by specialty drugs? I only heard one exasperating yes. <laughs> We're deep inside, all of you saying, oh my, holy shit. They're killing us, and they're unregulated. Right? Out of my, out of my spend, they account for about 70% of my pharma spend for a handful of people, relatively speaking. So let's talk about what this thing does. Let me tell you how this works. So uh, let's see what happens. So when we tried this out, so last year we tried this out. Just had a couple of people do it. So here's what my beta test was. So one time on Taco Tuesday, I flew down with one of my employees, right, to San Diego. And uh, so we get in San Diego, we're met by a, you know, a marked man. <laughs> Drive down to Tijuana. <laughs> Uh, go to a reputable hospital, pick up some meds, drive back over the border, right? Now, what happens is uh, with, with medication, right, with medication, here's the deal. The pharma markup in the U.S. is ridiculous because this is where they're capturing all of their R&D costs. Why? Because they can't. I can get the same prescription, the same medication from the same manufacturers in a different location for as much as 70% off. End of story. When you're talking about Humira, <coughs> Emerald, that cost me five, six thousand dollars per month here in the states, yeah. and I can and, and I can go to five minutes over the border. This place is literally five minutes over the border. Five minutes. And this is a Class A hospital. I went down there myself, like you said. Five minutes over the border. Class A facility to get from doctors, whatever else. You can transport a 90-day supply of medication over the border per day. So here's what I do: is I fly my employees down to San Diego. Transportation takes them down. This is with the doctors down there. They pick up the prescriptions. Again, all verified sourcing, all verified transportation. Everything is verified from the source. They pick up 90-day supply from the meds from the hospital. They transport it back to San Diego. In most cases, I have them stay overnight at a nice hotel to hide there or someplace else in the marina in San Diego. They get picked up, they go back down to, down to the hospital the next day, pick up a second day of, uh, or a second uh, supply of 90 days. They come back to the airport, fly home. Why would I do that? Yeah? Um, number one, the conference next year is in San Diego. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Can you do that in Canada? Yes, I can, I can do it in Canada, but I can't get wet meds in Canada. Uh, the, the question was, can I do it in, in, in Canada? Yes, I'm working, I'm working out on a deal with Farm, Farm Co. up there for meds, but they won't do wet meds. So these meds, uh, I can't get up there. But this one I can. And so the Sembro, Gamera, those are wet meds. I can't get them up there. So this one I can. But why would I do something like this? Let me tell you why. I had two people last year do this, did it twice, and it saved me after all costs. Concierge to help me out. All the costs, all the transportation costs, etc. I saved eighty thousand dollars. Eighty thousand dollars on two people last year alone. I understand last last month in May I sent four people down. <laughs> yeah, I killed it. I almost did hundred thousand dollars in savings. So that's why I do it. All legal, all fine. Yes, I have the waivers. No, the attorneys don't exactly like it. <laughs> Actually, I called up two attorneys. One said, "Dude, that's genius." Uh, here's, a, here's a recommendation for you. The other one said, you're having your corn fed mine. It's like, I know, it's great, isn't it? Uh, I said, yeah, walk me through on how. So I have waivers. Yeah, yes, I, they, they do it on their own time. Yes, I have waivers. And yes, I actually save, I, I, pay, I pay the employees a chunk of money to go. I cover all their costs. They have no co-pays whatsoever, right? They, the, the HSA folks have to meet their deductible. So if it's a brand new year like this month, I had to send somebody down. I said, go get one month's worth of, of drugs. Meet your deductible, which he did. So he met his deductible, sent him down, he went down and got six months. Understand the potential for how much cost savings there is in this. That's your big break. But again, MTO uh, Medical Travel Option is the, are the folks who uh, help me out with uh, managing this, this program. What is it called? Medical Travel Option. Medical Travel Option. Um, you know, Curry's up here, she's my, she's my BFF on this one. Yeah? So are you hearing a lot of feedback from employees about the scare? how they aren't kept as well as it is in the United States, and we're talking about this. 
Yeah, the question becomes, do I have any scares about uh, you know, things like insulin and how it's kept and such like that? The, and I don't send them down for insulin because there's not a big enough. It's, it's a big talk in Canada, though, to go to Canada for the insulin costs in the northern countries right now. Yeah, the question, yeah, the comment was uh, there's a big talk to go up to the north for insulin and such. I don't have enough cost savings for to go down for insulin just yet uh, with all the costs in there. There might be a tiny little margin to go down to Mexico for it, but I'm not, I'm not there yet. Uh, we're going for it. Right now, the, the ones that we've gone down for are Humira and Emerald, and uh, it's taken me a fortune so far. Uh, so far, so good. Uh, we've had the uh, occasional reluctant person, but that's all right. Well, let's keep going on some of these because i got a few more. Uh, you may take a look at reference-based pricing. This is one that I don't do. I told you that uh, out of all the things that I recommended here, there's one that I don't do. This is the one that I don't do. This is the one where you can go out and name your own pricing if you feel like you want to go to a, a direct provider and, uh, and try to negotiate prices directly. I've met one uh, one group who lives who, who's a big, it's a large company, but they have a base in a small town, and they have kind of the muscle to, to negotiate that. Good for them. I'm not a big fan because it could put your employees in a bind if they don't negotiate the bills just right. Uh, but it's a hot topic. I threw it in the list so that you don't get done and say, well, you didn't mention reference-based pricing. Now, for those of you who throw it in the feedback, he mentioned reference-based pricing, but he didn't say much. Okay. Either way, I don't win. Okay. There we go. <laughs> All right. Another one is, is a captive. Captives are an opportunity if you're looking for a different option. If you are self-funded, understand there are three buckets of money that you fund when you're self-funded. There are three potential buckets of money. One is the claims, and that's to the medical side where you're paying for them going to the doctor. Another bucket of money that you're paying for is on the pharma, right? You're paying for your PBM. Another bucket of money is your stop loss. Now, you can pay for the standard stop loss where you write them a check and they just cover it and be good, whatever. A captive is much like pooling money with other employers that get together, like-minded folks get together, and you pool your money. As you pool your money together, if you all are risk sensitive, some of these pools are really small, some of these pools of employers are a bit larger. And as you manage this pool of money, if you have a good year, you may save some money. If you save some money as this pool, you may have the opportunity to get some money back and, dis and disperse it back. If you have a bad year, a particularly bad year, you know, they may have some overs there, and you may just not get anything back, which is what you're getting anyway with your stop loss, right? You write the check, you throw it in, whether they may raise your rates or not raise your rates, just like it's a secondary insurance. But in some cases, because you're part of this captive, you have a decision-making opportunity to be part of the board and make some decisions on what happens with this money. But again, in a bad year, you may be able to also mitigate the cost increase because if you have, for example, one case of cancer, but it's an anomaly. You've been pretty good so far, but all of a sudden, boom, you got this one acute case of something. They may just decide, you know what, instead of us raising your rates for your stop loss, why don't you just pony up an extra hundred grand and we'll just call it good and we won't assess you an increase. You can negotiate that kind of stuff. And it may make that kind of sense and you have some flexibility there. But the whole point is, is if, if you're doing well, and you're doing fantastic, you join this captain, you actually have the opportunity to make money back. It's an investment with this pool. That's an opportunity. Anyway, there's more to that, but it's worth looking into if you're flexible, familiar, and you're looking for some new opportunities. Don't have enough time to really go into full captives, but that's something that we started this year. We went to a particularly small captive, but it's a very well-run captive. International mail order scripts. This is, yeah, this is in addition to the other one that we talked about because this is one that you can add on. We use a group called Petra RX. This comes from the mistress broker. Uh, but this is a bolt-on product. This goes outside my PBM. It is not a PBM. It's a bolt-on product. Petra RX is one where I can, uh, they have a long list of medications. If they're on the PPO program, then uh, if, if, if their drug is on this list, because they source these directly from the inter international manufacturers. The employees can receive these drugs, prescriptions to the mail order, 90 day supply. They get these rates by skipping the US market. And so they receive them from the cell, you know, from about seven countries, you know, New Zealand, uh, UK, Canada, some different sources. Again, it's all legal, it's fine. Um, but none of this is, none of this is wrong. Uh, but because they're skipping the US markup, I'm saving about 50% on the cost of these drugs. And these are some more standard drugs, they're not specialty drugs. Because I'm saving so much, I waive the co-pays to the employees. So they're saving that $15 a month, they're saving that whatever. They get the meds free 90 day supply in their mail. To me, the employer, I'm saving about 50% off of the negotiated rate of what I would get through my PBM. 
it's huge. I've only had maybe a few dozen, maybe three or four dozen people use this, and in the first you know, 18 months or so, I saved over 50 grand on this. It's, it's just going light. We've just blown this thing up. We're, we're pushing it hard now. But for those who are using this, and again, it's a bolt-on product, so it doesn't compete with my PBM. My PBM knows that I'm doing it. I have full disclosure. It's not a secret. But again, this is just another product that I have another broker working on because they get some commissions on it. So I have somebody else doing the legwork for me to run this program. Multifaceted approach, folks. I have to have all these products going for me so I can have people managing it themselves. Those who are doing this, they love it. Why? Because they're not paying any co-pays. They get 90-day supply in their mail, and it's good to go. It's cool. Even those who are on an HSA plan, if they're on an HSA plan and they have a preventative drug, you know that list of like 300 drugs that are, that are preventative, they can do this. What's in it for them? They don't save any money because those are free anyway to them. But they get the 90-day supply in the mail. So they get convenience. I still save a ton of money on the preventative drugs. All right, a few other things here. Telemedicine, if you don't have telemedicine, get it. How can you promote it? Make it so ridiculously cheap that they have to pay attention. Last year we rolled out telemedicine and made it $10, $10 a shot. That got a few people's attention. Now here's the deal. Telemedicine, we have to understand this in two ways. Number one, for the PPO, you can make it whatever the price is. So we rolled it out as 10 bucks. For the HSA, the price is the price until they meet their deductible, right? So we had to promote it out and say, guys, look, it's only 40 bucks versus the 150 bucks you're going to pay if you go to the doctor while you're meeting your, your deductible. So we had to pitch that, let them know, like, it's only 45 bucks, and then it's going to be 10 bucks. This year we said, you know what, not only do we save a ton of money, so we dropped the rates as ridiculous as we did on the premiums, we made telemedicine free. We made it free. Why? Because we could. And look, do I not want to make it free? I want to drive the behavior here because as the employer, well, won't that jack up participation? I sure hope so. Because I'd rather pay for people to go out and spend my base cost of 40 bucks a visit than the 150 bucks a visit to go see a primary care physician. Do I not? 80% of every condition you're going to go see the doctor for, you already know what you need. 80%. And why should they go there? drive there, sit in the waiting room, and blah, 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 when I can have them go to it for 40 bucks on me. I'm still saving a huge margin. Even if 20% of those are, are, are situations that they didn't need the doctor for in the first place, so be it. Let them, go, let them go do it. I gave telemedicine away for free. You want this to work? Give it back to the employees. Give it back to the employees. Coupons. Really, Wade? Yes, coupons. Now, I have GoodRx, but there are a few others up here. Understand the power of coupons. GoodRx, when they pop this thing up, chances are good that even with your best negotiated rate, they can get a 90-day supply of their medication for cheaper using a cash price than they can for three copays. Okay, whatever your copay is per month on your medication, right? Let's say it's even 10 bucks a month. Let's say it's 10 bucks a month. So over 90 days, that's 90, that's 30 bucks. Well, they could do a mail order. Your folks, most of them don't do mail order because they just don't do it, right? But let's say it's 15 bucks a month because that's what the averages are going for these days on your generics. So it's 45 bucks a month. The average cost of going out here to GoodRx to get a script for a 90-day supply is just around 20 bucks. That's a cash price. They pop it in here, and here's how the coupon thing works. They, log, they, they pop it in here, they put in their zip code, and they say, show me where the local pharmacies are. They put in what their medication is. They put in what the strength is. They put in for a 90-day supply. Here comes a list of all the pharmacies within the area, within a, you know, X number of miles. And it shows them by the distance how close the pharmacy is. Then it's going to show them what the cash price is for that script. Chances are good they will be able to find that medication for a 90-day supply for about 20 bucks. Trust me on this one, you are probably paying hundreds of dollars for that 90-day supply on your plan. When they go pay this for cash, they can still use their FSA card, they can still use their HRA card, their, their HSA card. They can still use that, that card to pay for their meds. They pay less, they could be saving hundreds of dollars themselves a year. You're going to be paying thousands of dollars less a year 
It will never hit your plan. It will never hit your plan by using coupons. Look at it. Think about it. Play with it. Yes, it's a strategy. You can build it in. Just because it's been around for years doesn't mean it's not a strategy. Finally, you know, you may have an on-site gym, you may not. Understand, I'm just telling you to use it. Do it because this is one of those things that I've got more people in shape and they get them to the other side than anything else. But the on-site gym doesn't help unless you get the on-site trainer there too. This is something that we've done this last year and we've taken a chunk of our cost savings and I've paid for the on-site trainer to hold small group classes yes, during the work day, to come on in and do this stuff. It's created momentum, it created strategy, it's helped us to, to get people over that, over the, those humps, and it's done a great job. So, you know, at this point, you're probably coming up with these excuses and saying, well, you know, I don't know, this is, this is crazy, but, you know, what are you gonna do? But, you know, if you're gonna decide to do things, you gotta decide that you gotta make a choice. But one thing's for sure, if you haven't decided, right, if you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice not to decide. But it's up to you and you got to do it. So anyway, feel free to get a hold of me. Uh, my contact information is here. The slides are out there. Reach out to me off -side, uh, offline and I'm happy to, to reach out to you too. So thank you very much.